Good evening. Welcome to the August 9th, 2021 Merrimack School Board meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Before we get started, I just wanted to say that board member Jenna Hardy and Lori Peters are excused for this evening. Next up is public participation. For those of you that wish to address us in public participation, I ask that you come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the record um, before uh, providing public participation. Do I have any public participation this evening? Hi, Jennifer Page, Three Nichols Lane. Um, so I missed the last meeting, I apologize, I was on vacation. Um, but I did talk two weeks ago, or two meetings ago when you guys were talking about mask policies. And I said, I'm a pediatrician. I said, well, yeah, all of what you've presented sounded good, but let's see what happens with the Delta variant. Um, I would like to suggest tonight that you guys revi revisit the mask policy. Um, I think to put our under 12 year old children who have no opportunity to be vaccinated fully at risk and exposed in school with no masking and no social distancing is irresponsible. Um, I think actually even the high schoolers should be masked, but um, I know things aren't horrible here in New Hampshire yet. Um, but if you look at what's going on across the country, there is nothing that says to me that's not going to happen here. If you walk into Shaw's, you will see me in my mask. You might see one other person in a mask. We're a community that doesn't have more than 50% of the adults vaccinated. There's no way all of those people who are walking around unmasked are vaccinated. We are not taking this seriously enough. It is not done. It's not gone. It's not under control. And I think we need to revisit the policy on masking in school before school starts. Thank you. Do I have any more public participation? Okay. Um, moving on to the next item, which is recognitions. Um, I first wanted to take a moment um, to thank both Matt Chevenel and Melissa Gagney, who's sitting in our office, our director of HR. Um, for all of their help and support over the last couple of months, particularly, um, obviously, you know, for a long time that you've been in the district, but over the last couple months, you've really offered a huge amount of support um, to the board and the board's initiatives around hiring, um, around uh, Matt covering the gap from when our prior superintendent left until Bill Olson began. And I just can't tell you how much we really appreciate all of the work and professionalism that both of you have provided to us. Thank you. Thank you. Any other recognition? Thank you. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to just say that we have, you may have noticed that we have revised the agenda. Um, Bill Olson proposed some changes to the agenda and some of them, um, they, they all align really with what I think um, would work really well going forward. So you'll start to see um, things like times on the side, um, which gives us a little direction. And for people that want to come at a, you know, try to hit a certain topic at a certain time, this is our goal. Um, you know, they're just estimate times, so it's obviously we can't hold it, you know, to the minute, but we're gonna give it our best to give it a shot. And certainly if anyone from the public has any particular input as it relates to the agenda and what you feel would be most helpful, please do let us know. We've also put out our supporting board materials, um, any of non-confidential, not without confidential information, um, again, to be more transparent with the public and to be able to um, help those at home get a clear understanding of the things that we're reviewing. So I hope that you find it helpful. And um, again, we're open to any feedback. Um, the next item is the informational update. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Mr. Olson for the superintendent update. Oh, no, it's not on. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you uh, were willing to uh, 
try the new agenda format. I, I do think from experience it's, uh, it's easier for the public uh, to follow and we talk about the issues of transparency. I think it helps in, in that regard. So thank you very much for your willingness to be flexible with that. Uh, there have been some questions about uh, why my title is um, Chief Educational Officer and not Interim Superintendent. It has to do with uh, some New Hampshire technicalities with respect to uh, degrees that a person possesses. Um, I have been a 16-year um, superintendent in a, in a very, uh, very highly successful school system in Massachusetts. I have been licensed in Massachusetts as a superintendent for many years uh, based on the degrees I've had and the experience. But in New Hampshire, uh, that was not allowable, the, the respective degrees. And so uh, I did speak with the person in the Licensure Bureau of uh, New Hampshire Department of Education and that individual said that um, it sometimes happens, uh, that there isn't true reciprocity in terms of licensure between New Hampshire and some other states. Um, and so it, it's probably better to have your title listed as a chief educational officer. And I said, that's fine. You know, someone once asked me uh, before I took the job here, will that make a difference in you taking the job? And I said, title means nothing. Uh, what I'm looking for is a wonderful community, which I know this is, to work with a fine staff, an outstanding staff, to make wonderful things happen for the children of Merrimack. And that's, that's the objective. So, you know, what's, what's in a title? Well, it all depends who you are. And for me, it's, it's not very much. It's just that, you know, my job is to work with Matt and Kim and, and Melissa and all of you and the staff and the community uh, to give our students the best school year possible. So just a little explanation because I think some of you have, have had those questions. Um, I had a wonderful meeting, remote meeting with our elementary staff and our secondary staff about a week and a half ago. Uh, had a meeting with parents. Also, I believe there were about 80 parents. I'll have some additional meetings, uh, both remote and in person. Uh, we'll have a, a remote meeting again coming up pretty soon at, in the evening hours for those people, obviously, who work during the day and weren't able to participate. So I want to make sure we have as much opportunity to engage the community in conversation as possible because you, you are the parents of the children we're serving. Uh, it's uh, very important for us to listen to you uh, about what you feel we do well, uh, well at and what you feel uh, maybe we need to address from time to time. And, uh, and every school system has those uh, issues. So looking forward, along with Kim and Matt and any others who, who wish to join in from time to time uh, to engage both our staff, our students also. It's very important that we talk with our students, but also uh, parents and residents in the community uh, additionally. Um, I have met with the, the police chief and the deputy chief had a very productive meeting with him uh, later this week or early next week, I'll be meeting with the, uh, with the fire chief. Um, I had a chance to speak also with Representative uh, Bill Boyd. Had a very good and productive conversation uh, with him. Um, I meet uh, weekly at the present time along with Kim with the area superintendents. We talk about strategy moving forward in terms of reopening of schools with respect to the mitigating factors uh, such as masking, uh, distancing, et cetera, and um, I'll talk to that in a little bit about the, uh, when I come to the COVID update. Um, this Wednesday, we will be participating in the New Hampshire of Department of Public Health Services, another webinar, uh, to see where the state is in relation to uh, the guidelines that the CDC has most recently issued, uh, the statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, both of which uh, have uh, preface the statements and their guidelines by stating and recognizing how important it is for students to be back into school. Uh, I can say unequivocally and uh, with the pediatricians I've worked with in the past, um, COVID transmission was not the big issue last year when everyone certainly was, was masked. It was anxiety, stress disorders, and mental health issues that pediatricians were seeing in exponentially greater, in exponentially greater numbers. Uh, so we'll be participating in that, um, in that uh, webinar. Uh, we will be meeting, um, and I'll talk to you in a minute about the Health and Safety Task Force uh, update uh, in terms of what we're going to be meeting about this Friday 
after we have the webinar with the uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, I do want to let you know also there is a um, back to school immunization clinic uh, with a number of available immunizations uh, that is taking place this Wednesday. Uh, August 11th from 1 to 3 p.m. at Merrimack High School. Uh, and I will post this on our uh, webpage uh, just for maximum distribution. Um, put it on our Facebook uh, page, uh, page also because I think that will uh, be very helpful. Chickenpox, COVID-19, diphtheria, hepatitis A and B, uh, HIV, HPV, measles, meningitis, mumps, pertussis, uh, the monococcal, polio, rubella, and, and tetanus. And so a number of uh, possible available vaccinations. And so that is my update, uh, informational update for tonight. And I'll talk to you a little bit more in a few minutes about Health and Safety Task Force update. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the board on the update? Okay, we'll move on to the Assistant Superintendent for curriculum update. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, so we've been really busy as a leadership team working on planning for the opening of school. We have met, uh, we did a two-day retreat looking at the recommendations from the various task force, including the instructional task force, the health and safety task force, operations task force, uh, assessment task force, a lot. And um, as we have updated those various recommendations from the task forces, and they've been, if need be, vetted by the school board, we have posted them on to our um, webpage, our district website, so people can go and see what those recommendations are from this wide variety of teachers and leaders who have been working um, toward making some really solid recommendations. Um, we are really um, in a, a scurry right now. We're planning for the August Academy with educators, paraeducators and professional staff, which is really going to be a September Academy, but uh, called August Academy as in the past. We will have four days of professional development for the professional staff and three days of professional development for the paraeducators with a day set aside for staff to set up their classrooms and a day for local schools to have their own uh, staff meeting date. The focus for training for the professional staff will be around um, Universal Design for Learning, UDL, as well as Canvas um, training so that we can have some uh, more consistency with the template for Canvas we still have, continue to have staff working throughout August um, on various task force, including one that is on Canvas to cr start to create some consistency around that. Other than that, um, we're just getting really excited about making plans for the opening of school. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on. Okay, Shana. Um, you have mentioned that uh, their task force work that the board doesn't vet. Uh, can you give examples of what those are? Because you, you mentioned what we, we've obviously seen a couple of presentations, but what are you uh, working on that the board hasn't, that we're going to just be implementing? Like, so I believe there was um, the technology task force was really more about aligning um, technology and remote devices. So they'll make recommendations or have made recommendations. I can't tell you exactly what's been mm -hmm. posted. Um, there was the assessment and data um, committee that made recommendations for when certain benchmarks will be delivered at the elementary, middle, and high school, um, and an assessment calendar, which was primarily done by the language arts coordinators. The operations task force is still um, working right now, so we don't have a specific update at this point. Um, so those are the ones that I can recall off the top of my head that wouldn't necessarily need to go for school board approval, but are more um, customary events that would happen over the summer toward preparing for the opening of the school year. Great. Thank you. All right. And next is the uh, Assistant Superintendent for Business, Matt. Thank you. As Kim mentioned, the, uh, the task force, the, uh, the operation task force really has to wait until some of the other task force come to their, their final decision and vet it in front of the public and the public is, is comfortable with that. Uh, we need to know specifically what what are the what are the desires and what are the expectations of the community in regards to the health and safety task force. That's really key as to what we're going to be doing on the operational side. So that's why that will be the end of the process to show you how we're going to react to all these different task force recommendations, kind of like what we did last year. Um, in addition, 
we have our ventilation project moving along. Um, a lot of the prep work has been done, meaning prep work, cut a hole in the wall so you can put the unit ventilator in. Uh, right now, even though the order was placed quite a few months ago, we're still waiting on the delivery of the unit ventilators, but once they come in, they'll be ready to be wired up to our EBI system and um, placed in the classrooms. Our first priority is going to be Merrimack High School in the, uh, the English wing on the second deck that we removed teachers from because the CO2 levels were so high. So we're gonna hit that first once these units come in. And in addition to that, we're also working on a project uh, that is complements of the uh, trustee of trust funds. In January, you know, we, we've had so many meetings here where it's been about COVID, where it's, as it should be, and we've discussed a lot of items that were really important to the people and to the board and to the community that a lot of these things haven't been spoken about because there was really real no room at the end for them because most of the meetings were COVID related and how do we relate with that. But back in January, I went in front of the trustees of trust funds, talked about certain issues that we had. They were in a mood where they wanted to make a donation from the Master Cola Fund and they authorized the expenditure of around $350,000 from that fund. And what that fund gets us, is you recall in the capital improvement plan, the bleachers in the Smith gym, wooden bleachers, not ADA accessible, they're really slick. In order to get from the top to the bottom, you have to grab people's shoulders and everything like that. Those are gone, those are replaced. They're replaced with brand new bleachers with railings on them and they're ADA accessible. That project's done. We also have in the JMU's APR, where everybody goes to vote and we have our deliberative session, those bleachers are taken away. The floor in the APR couldn't be refinished anymore. It was, I don't know how many years old, but it was pretty old. And so we have redone the entire floor. I'm not gonna tell you what, it look, what it's gonna look like right now, but it's not your standard wooden floor because we use that as a cafeteria too. And the wheels on the calf tables would dig into the hardwood. So we used a different sort of material for that. And Bill Wilkes, who was on the, um, the uh, Trustees of Trust Funds, you know, made a comment that we could probably, instead of tearing everything up, do a relay over because this product is rather thin and it comes in rolls and it's almost indestructible. And that turned out to be the case. So there's gonna be, a, there is right now a brand new floor in there. That's complete. And then the bleachers are coming in in the next couple of weeks. So you're gonna have blue bleachers, with a, a blue band around the entire gym floor and the gym floor itself is gonna be a light gray and then it has to be all striped up and it's gonna look fantastic. So through the, the graciousness of the trustees, we knocked a lot of items off of our capital improvement plan without the utilization of taxpayer funds. My one regret is uh, our good friend Jack Balcom is not gonna be here to see the, the fruits of his uh, approval and getting this passed. And that kind of makes me sad, but hopefully Jack is up there and he'll be looking down on us. So sometimes in the fall, um, it'd be nice when everything is settled um, to perhaps start a board meeting off with the trustees, much like we did with the library a couple of years ago and just have everybody do a tour and just kind of thank them publicly for their, for their efforts in supporting the school district as they always have in the past. So essentially that's, uh, that's my update. Thank you, Matt. Uh, questions, Shannon? Just a comment, I think it's a great idea and you're right, I was thinking about Jack and I knew exactly where you were going. Yeah. yeah he was such a good friend of this district in, in all that he did. Uh, drum classes for, you know, drum 
sessions with kids. I think he did it reads a lot. Um, so uh, he's one that's going to be missed by our district so greatly. But when we do have that event, I know it's for the trustees to see their investment. But it, if we can invite Jack's wife, I think that'd be great. Oh, absolutely. Thank yes. you. Thank, Thank you, Shannon. Wonderful. Decades of service to this town. Absolutely. Mr. Balcom. He was, he was the first, he was, uh, I think, the first board member who greeted me when I first started here 22 years ago. You know, Jack was on the board, and uh, he's always been an exceedingly kind gentleman, and uh, his, his kind and his like will be missed by this community greatly. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next update is the school board update. I have one item. A couple of meetings ago, the board had authorized the expenditure of $1,500 in order to send our policy manual to the New Hampshire School Board Association for a service that's offered, which is they go through and they review the policies, look for any gaps. Um, and it was a, a good way to start to really um, continue to try to bring our policies up to date. Um, I've been working with district administration and Sandy Swanson on this effort. Um, Sandy did reach out to them. Unfortunately, there are a number of districts in front of us, so it looks like we may not get those results back for September of 2022, um, which is disappointing, but we are in queue. Um, so if anything changes, I'll keep people posted, but um, it doesn't mean we can't continue to move to update our policies as needed and certainly be proactive about updating policies um, that we would like to update. Any questions there? Uh, thank you. And then no student representative update. And the moving on to the old business. And the first item, uh, Matt Chavanel, is the terms to accept the $34,848.32 grant. I guess the, the question came up last time at the uh, school boarding, board meeting was to, we were going to put it on consent and then see if we wanted to encumber those funds into the 21-22 school year. So that's the decision that the board is, is looking at, is, is in, under consideration thereof. And that's something that we could do. Um, my audit is this week, and so I can book that as a uh, reserve for encumbrances. And uh, it, it would be for you know the care and keeping of the water filtration system. It also it uh, it can also be used to to offset the the cost of the testing that we're doing currently now with lead. We're almost complete with that. We did have a couple of areas which kind of surprised me that we didn't have them in the past, but we're going to be taking care of those immediately. And uh, it was primarily in the high school. And, uh, you know, as more information comes, when I get the final report and it's all summarized, I will, we will publish that online. We'll link to Facebook. It'll say the areas that were over um, than they should have been and then we'll retest after our re remediation efforts go and then show them as, as clear like we did back in 2017. So it could be used for that too because the testing alone is like five to $6,000. So water purification, it matches. So if you wanna consider that, you can have a conversation and let me know. Shannon. I think that's exactly what we want to do. Honestly, the thought of putting it to the general fund to go back to the taxpayer, although it has great appreciation, um, we're just going to ask for that money back because we, we should be doing due diligence on water safety. We wouldn't have spent all that money on the filtration if we didn't do it with the objective of having the safest water our children can, can take in. And we have this as an unexpected and appreciated um, funds that can actually accomplish those goals beyond what our expectations were. Uh, without having to ask the taxpayers to help us with that. So I think it's, it's, it's a, a, a timely gift. And I think we should use it productively to stay on top of water safety in this district because we've been, we've been good stewards so far, so let's stay on top of the, the job. And we have been exceedingly proactive. Oh, too. absolutely, we have. Yes. We wouldn't have had the reimbursement if we didn't do the filtration that someone else did. <laughs> That's right. So absolutely, and we appreciate that. Yeah. So do we need a motion? Or? Yeah, do yes. you want to make a motion, Shannon? Sure, I move that we encumber the $34,848.32 grant uh, for the purpose of uh, water safety operations for the district for the upcoming year. I second it. Awesome. Second, any additional comments? Um, I just have one. I mean, 
I mean, I agree 100% with what Shannon said, and um, the district was extremely proactive, you know, getting those uh, filters in, uh, yeah. bef you know, long before we have our general tap water, you know, in Merrimack filtered. And so, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and that was a good hindsight looking back mm -hmm. to say we got that in, and so now it's time to continue to maintain them and take care of them so they continue um, to provide healthy and safe water for the children of the, and uh, staff of the district. All right. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Um, that's three zero zero. And moving on to the health and safety task force update. Thank you. Uh, the health and safety task force will be convening again this Friday. Uh, we want to hear what the New Hampshire Department of Public Health Services has to say um, at its webinar this week. Uh, to see if they have uh, changed any of their position with respect to the recommendations from the Center for Disease Control or the American Academy of, of Pediatrics. Um, we are hoping uh, to have uh, Erin Olson, no relation uh, to me, uh, the town's health, uh, uh, health officer at our meeting uh, because we think it's important to have uh, the health officer from the community uh, participate with us in, in our, our meetings. Uh, we will be reviewing the latest information from the CDC, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the latest statistics that pertain to New Hampshire as of uh, August 5th. Uh, there were 26 new cases in Merrimack, about 56.5% of the town, according to this data, uh, has been vaccinated. And there's where I would once again ask that this is a very important partnership with respect to keeping children and staff in schools. Uh, we, you know, we talk about COVID and the impact uh, it might have. We, we tend to think immediately of students, but the importance also pertains to staff in that we have to make sure that we have adequate staffing to be able to educate the students uh, pre-K through 12 uh, and that has been a significant issue in many school systems throughout the country over the last 18 months. So there's where I would ask uh, if you have not been vaccinated and you are not opposed for whatever reason to be vaccinated, I would ask that you, you do get your, your vaccine uh, because it's only going to help. It is one of the major mitigating strategies that the CDC has consistently stated. Uh, and so I once again, uh, this has to be a, a strong partnership on behalf of all of us, both within the school system and outside of the school system in an effort to keep students in school and to keep staff in the school buildings also. The supply of substitute teachers over the last several years uh, has been uh, greatly concerning to superintendents across New England, across the country. It's uh, uh, it's a situation where the numbers have been dwindling uh, for whatever reason, uh, and it's becoming progressively more difficult to obtain substitutes to cover classes. So there's a lot of variables that come into play here in terms of trying to work together to make sure that both students and staff can be in school every day. And that is one of the first things that the, both the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, prefaces their comments about is that they are strongly, strongly in favor of children being back in school full time because of the mental health issues that pediatricians uh, have seen over the last 18 months uh, with children um, being really not as connected, certainly, as they have been in the past, not only to each other, but to the teachers who oftentimes are very strong and powerful mentors in their, in their lives. Uh, one of the things that we will be looking at is the mitigating factors. Uh, all of the operating strategies, such as lunch, such as passing in the corridors. We know that transportation is subject to a CDC order, not a guideline, but an order, and that all students and the drivers on school buses and vans must be masked. Okay, And uh, once again, that is a CDC order. Uh, we will be looking at um, any possible revisions, as I said, to any of the operating strategies that we uh, the committee had proposed Several weeks ago, we'll be presenting you with updated data that pertains to Merrimack, uh, and there's where Aaron Olson comes in particularly importantly. And uh, Shannon, you made a, a point at the last meeting in terms of can we put together a frequently asked questions 
uh, document in terms of uh, who the parents call, um, in terms of any particular issues they might have or accommodations they might look for. Uh, that is one of the tasks that we're going to be taking a look at. Um, and you know, Kim is going to be very important in working with us on, on that uh, this week. Okay, and I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Question, Shannon? Um, I think that, you know, even hearing Dr. Page's testimony tonight, we definitely have to keep this as a standing um, agenda item as a board, for starters. We need to be on top of the numbers. We're meeting every two weeks. I think that's, that's a fair temperature check. You know, I guess pun intended, I'm not even sure. Um, to make sure that we're doing the right thing, to make sure that we're staying on top of the data that drives the right decision mm -hmm. and helps our families also stay in a, in a process where they can advocate appropriately for their children based on the testimony that we can provide every couple of weeks about you know what we're seeing for cases, uh, what any variants are doing as far as impacting health and impacting the, um, and I, I know, um, I, just from the news, which I hate to use, I'd rather use you, Dr. Page, but, <laughs> but uh, where the news is saying that it's highly more highly transmissible, where the original was, I think, one to three or four, and this one's one to eight. So for every infected person, it can easily infect eight people. So again, it definitely has that more, you know, more than double the infection rate, almost triple the infection rate. Um, and so those are the kind of things I think about, too. Um, and we need to keep on, on top of that. So again, we're, we may stay the course, we need to make sure that families are able to make the right decisions every couple of weeks based on what, what we're seeing in our in our data pool. Uh, please know that it is my intent to have a health and safety updated at every single board meeting. Great. And uh, most prominently will be a, a COVID component of that. So uh, that was sort of standard procedure in my former position. It will be the standard procedure going forward here. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have one. I, I just have a suggestion. I've made it in the past, but I would um, offer it again as, for consideration, which is around kind of in line with the frequently asked questions document, um, which is the creation of perhaps an email that's, you know, COVID questions or uh, health and safety questions. Because what I've found and what I anticipated and is what I found to be true is that parents don't always know who to go to mm -hmm. um, to get these questions. And so they're um, centralizing those questions, I feel like is important because it allows the ability to see what questions are coming up to be proactive and get in front of it. Otherwise, questions may go to a principal. I get a lot of them because they don't know where else to go. Um, and so by creating a mailbox, you know, per se, that mm -hmm. you, know, you know, many people might have we can continue to build that frequently asked questions and keep that updated um, so that people are able to self-serve if they so choose. Um, now, you know, and we can always be available to ans uh, answer those questions, but some people do like to just research and find out the answers themselves. And the more that we organize that and make it available on our website, I feel like that would be a great service to families. We will be glad to do that. I agree. <clears throat> you know, having like, you know, just even the organizational chart of who's who and who, you know, who answers to who, and then parents could go on and find that link. Yeah, part of that certainly will be covered in the frequently asked questions, mm -hmm. talking about part of those answers, but, but I'm sure not all of them. So finding out from the public what's important to them, uh, what they would like to have responses to, um, is extraordinarily important. We will do that. Okay. And it's a suggestion. It's not, you know. It, it, we started to see this afternoon uh, a number of emails come in with comments or questions. And so I think as we continue to approach the beginning of the school year, uh, it will only increase. And, and this type of document and process would be very helpful for them. Great, thank you. I'm glad you find it helpful. Um, moving on now to. So if I could just recommend, sometimes the board will still get that testimony. We could probably forward to that same address too when we get testimony under that umbrella so that we can put it into the system for, for the proper tracking. So we as board members should follow that same suit with what we get. Exactly, by copy of this email, I'm asking you know, our centralized person, yeah, health and safety email to answer the question. If there's any concerns, let, let us know. And then that at least um, allows the right people to be answering the questions. Because for myself, I'm often removed from the day-to-day -day stuff, and I will reach out and try to help and build pe you know, bring people in. But if it goes to the right people the first time, or I can direct them to a 
central point of contact. I think that's you know helpful for the board and certainly helpful for being able to track, as Shannon mentioned, you know the full um, set of questions that are being asked. Thanks, Shannon. Great suggestion. Uh, moving to new business, um, the first item there is the first reading of the Title IX sexual harassment policy and grievance process um, through ACAC, and I, um, we have Melissa Gagne here at the table. Thanks for joining us, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Uh, speaking of keeping, can you hear me okay? Is that screen light now? Yeah. Okay. Maybe go a little closer. Okay. Maybe go a little closer if you can. Is that better? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's better. Okay, speaking of keeping policies up to date, uh, we have our Title IX sexual harassment policy to bring forward to the board this evening. And in uh, past practice, we would read word for word the policy. This policy is 19 pages, uh, so I'm going to give a brief overview, and then we plan to post the policy on our website tomorrow morning for review for the second reading at the next uh, board meeting. Uh, so back in the fall, we had put together a committee of administrators to review the sample policy set forth by the School Boards Association. Uh, we made some small changes just to add a few specifics, not taking any um, of the important information out. Um, but we did add additional supportive measures. Uh, one thing I think is extremely important about this policy, of course, is the definition of sexual harassment. So I will read that uh, for the board. Uh, sexual harassment prohibited under Title IX and by this policy is conduct on the basis of sex occurring in a school system, education program, or activity that satisfies one or more of the following. A school district employee conditioning an aid, benefit, or service of an education program or activity on an individual's participation or refusal to participate in sexual conduct irrespective of whether the conduct is welcomed by the student or other employee. Unwelcome sex-based related conduct determined by a reasonable, reasonable person to be so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the education program or activity, or sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, or stalking as defined in state or federal law. And this policy applies to all employees, uh, contracted service providers, and employees. Any visitors or volunteers that come in contact with the district would be uh, referred to law enforcement or DCYF if there were to be any um, issue with Title IX uh, sexual harassment. And then one um, last thing I'd like to add is that we had uh, 40 attendees, including administrators, uh, school counselors, and uh, special education coordinators attend a training by our legal counsel back in January so that any member of the leadership team or school counselors or coordinators could be um, a part of the Title IX process. One thing this policy does outline is the grievance and complaint process if there were to be an allegation. Uh, so it was important for us to all be trained on every aspect, whether you were to be an investigator on a case or a decision maker um, on any type of case, depending on who that student or employee was that was accused of uh, sexual harassment. So that was very important to us. Um, we do have a Title IX coordinator in district in our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Kim Yarlott. Um, and then, like I said, the 40 um, administrators and counselors and coordinators that were trained as well could um, hold various roles in that process. Um, so this will be posted on our website, but we thought it would be very important to bring this forward to you um, sooner rather than later. Questions? Questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Melissa. Um, the next item is the K through six enrollments. Um, As Wilson. we approach the beginning of the school year, I wanted to present to you the enrollments uh, as they currently stand, which are subject to change uh, at our elementary school level. A lot of the research over the years has indicated that the child's achievement levels, um, adaptation in class, connections to others depend on the quality of the teacher, but also reasonable class size. And uh, pleased to say that we have some very, very good uh, class sizes at our elementary level. We will, we will keep an eye on the Master School Upper Elementary School in grade six 
as those um, uh, are a little bit higher, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to see them really continue to go much higher, certainly, than the 26. But most of them in grades K through 5 are, are excellent and uh, very positive in terms of approaching the school year um, and allowing teachers to get to know the students, both their academic strengths but also their social emotional strengths. And so um, I want to present these because I think you'll be very pleased with them. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you, you might have. Any questions, Lori? I was gonna say I'm very pleased with the class sizes. I think class size, especially this year, after uh, the turbulence we had, it's really important that teachers are going to be able to, you know, fill learning gaps and meet the needs of all students. So uh, I think this looks really good. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because that's what a lot of superintendents and assistant superintendents for curriculum instruction are looking at right now is can we keep the class sizes as manageable as possible because of the potential learning gaps? And um, so that's a, that's a particularly, particularly important issue to, uh, to bring yes, up. Sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Shannon. Um, I, w I know that sometimes we get that 11th hour rush to the enrollments. Um, and I know we had that at Thornton's a couple of years ago where I think it was second grade where mm -hmm. it just blew up this a development just had a bunch of second graders but I'm looking at grade six and um, although I I want to err on the side of caution uh, because I don't really want to bring someone on to band-aid to have them not necessary going forward however if you look at um, that enrollment of 284 you'd be looking at 23 and a half because you know you know so between 23 and 24 students if we added a 12th classroom at grade six, which is still more, it's equal if not slightly higher than the fifth grade enrollment. So that's the only thing I really had hesitation on was I thought that, you know, because you're going 25 to 26, if one more class would, again, because this is their last critical year, um, they're getting that middle school curriculum, basically that first kind of year of middle schoolish curriculum, and then they'll be going to middle school. So that's where we, as they're making a jump, the lesser the gap, the better it's gonna be for their transition to the next year. So critically, I look at that year as something that's gonna be very impactful. I looked at four and I looked at six. And those are the two where you're gonna to go to a different school, a different environment, a different structure. And we wanna make sure that the learning gaps are not going to be one more hurdle for them uh, because they didn't have enough individualized instruction. Yeah. So that's the only thing I would say on, on six is it looks a little tight for me. Yeah, we will keep a very careful eye on, on uh, the numbers, particularly in those grades. You know, the, the important issue also is not only the numbers, but the composition and the makeup mm -hmm. of the classes in terms of the issues that students are presenting and how complex those uh, those numbers might be. So mm -hmm. a lot of variables that come, in, come into yep. play. And I did forget Thornton's uh, kindergarten because the other two looked fine, but Thornton's kindergarten looked a little robust. Uh, because I think is, Kim, catch me if I'm wrong, isn't 15 the ideal for a kindergarten classroom? We have 18 and 17. 15 is the ideal enrollment and we are finding that um, kindergartners and kindergarten families are coming out of the woodwork right now yeah so I anticipate both Master Cola and Reed's Ferry School um, also growing in their kindergarten numbers which is not uncommon but mm -hmm. it's even more prevalent right now this year that mm -hmm. parents are starting to feel comfortable with the notion of their five-year-olds coming to kindergarten so we'll keep an eye on that as well Great. 15 is the ideal number okay just want to make sure I have my math right because yeah we opened kindergarten a long time ago together. <laughs> yes. So, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, and appreciate the heads up. What's coming down the pipe? The next item is House Bill 2, Prohibitive Practice. Well, a short time ago, uh, Governor Sununu signed into law the uh, House Bill 2, which was known uh, by different terms. Uh, I like to refer to it as prohibited practice law, which outlines uh, what teachers are allowed uh, to say or do and what positions they take, what we're allowed to do or not do in terms of providing professional development. So I conferred with uh, our Labor Council, uh, Kathleen Peel, and uh, have combined that with some information that was distributed by the New Hampshire Department of Public Education to essentially um, draft a memo to all staff that will go out um, subject to your, your review and any revisions that you might uh, find desirable 
I've included the provisions of the law. Uh, this was a summary from Attorney Peel that I found to be uh, very helpful. And also uh, do's and don'ts, recommendations for educators and reg recommendations for school districts that came directly from the uh, New Hampshire Department of Education. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety over this. Uh, essentially uh, what uh, Kim and I have spoken with the administrators about last week is that it represents to a certain degree uh, nothing more than common sense in terms of we want to do everything possible and have been and want to continue to do everything possible to not violate, violate the civil rights of any individual whether they are a staff member, a colleague or a student or, or a parent for that, that fact. Um, and we always want them to be treated with dignity and respect and um, discussions about issues such as racism that are part of a, an established curriculum for many, many years are certainly prohibited. Uh, what is not prohibited is an editorialization that one individual or one group of people are either superior or inferior to others based on their protected class as defined through civil rights legislation. So um, I think we and other school districts will be okay just as long as we talk with the staff um, and make sure that they understand that conversations dealing with uh, curriculum content uh, continue to be fine, uh, but these are the specific areas that we will not engage in and cannot engage in uh, because they represent a violation of civil rights of an individual. Questions there? No. I would just like to say this was extremely proactive of you, and I know that you're trying to circumvent anxiety that some of our teachers and staff have as well as families and you certainly got in front of this very proactively and you've already discussed it um, internally so I thank you mm -hmm. for that. Thank you and, and I do want to clarify also that we do not teach critical race theory okay because there are a lot of parents who are concerned about that not only in Merrimack but across the country. What we do teach is that content that is responsible that has been vetted for many, many years uh, on topics such as uh, racism and civil rights issues. And so we will continue to do that because it's our responsibility as part of educators to, to cover material such as that. Thank you. Um, moving on to the approval request, there's the July 26, 2021 minutes. Do I have a motion to Accept the minutes made by. I make a motion to accept the July 26, 2021 minutes. Okay, made by Lori, seconded by Shannon. Any updates or changes? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Abstain? That carries 201. Next one is the educator administrator resignations. Kim Yarlett. Thank you. I have three resignations to share with you. Uh, one is Alicia Dion, who is a science teacher at. Merrimack High School, Emily Hartman, a social studies teacher at Merrimack High School, and Melissa Gagnon, Director of Human Resources for the Merrimack School District. Do I have a motion uh, for the, um, oh, the, we can, they're separate, they're listed as separate. I guess you can go ahead and do the nominations as well sure. and then we'll vote on them together. Okay, thank you. For nominations, I have Christine Dombach, special ed reading teacher at Thornton's Ferry School, Emmeline Imbody, third grade teacher at Thornton's Ferry School, Emily Sousa, art teacher at Merrimack High School, Andrea Inamorati, she's going to be a one year only grade one teacher at Reed's Ferry School, Amanda Chass, grade six uh, teacher at James Mastercola Upper Elementary School, and Eva Quill, language arts teacher at Merrimack Middle School. And finally, uh, Mr. Stephen Clare, Principal uh, Merrimack High School. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the administrator resignations and nominations? I make a motion to accept the resignation and nominations. In a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, that's 300. The next one, moving on to other. Any committee reports? So, so my committee meets on the same nights as school board meetings lately, so, um, but Matt, I, I think if we could have a school building and planning committee meeting with updates, I would love to attend that if you don't put it on a Monday. <laughs> yeah, we, we normally try and stay away, um, 
But yeah, I've been in conversation with Rich Hendricks about okay. that, and so we, we will do, do such, yes. Thank you. Any correspondence to come before the board? I have a couple. Um, the board has received several emails um, regarding the health and safety protocols, specifically um, many of which concerned had concerns regarding the masks for the fall reopening. Um, a couple of those had some specific concerns regarding individual students, which I've directed to administration to follow up with or to for them or appropriate leadership to follow up um, with those parents. And I also received two individually along the same lines, again, concerned about the safety uh, protocols, health and safety protocols for the fall. Any, Shannon? I had two. I had one along those same lines. And then I also have one that um, wanted a better understanding of uh, the use of facilities process, and I directed them to the proper administrators of overseer facilities. Thanks. Any others? Okay, moving on to comments. Any comments? Seeing none, uh, we are moving now to the public comments on agenda items. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board um, regarding the agenda items? If so, please, again, present your name and your address for the record. Seeing none, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Second. Made by Shannon, seconded by Lori. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That's 300. We will move on and sign the manifest. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you.